So Kip, we both knew Dick Feynman as a colleague, but for those who didn't know him personally, it's hard to explain what a remarkable scientist he was. Yeah, it really is. It's amazing. Because he would sometimes come up with these astounding insights, seemingly on the spur of the moment. How was he able to do that? Yeah, I really don't know. But I, do rem <laughs> I really do remember one occasion of this in 1963, mm -hmm. just after uh, Martin Schmidt here at Caltech had discovered uh, quasars in the sky. And people, physicists and astronomers all around the world, they were trying to figure out what these quasars were. And uh, here at Caltech, Willie Fowler, together with Fred Hoyle, who was visiting uh, from Cambridge at the time, uh, they invented a theory of quasars that was based on supermassive stars, stars that weighed a million times what the sun weighs. And uh, they gave a seminar about their theory. And in the middle of the seminar, uh, Richard Feynman stood up and objected. He said, those stars of yours, they're going to be unstable because of general relativity. They're going to collapse and destroy themselves. And everybody in the room was just flabbergasted. They were just amazed at this insight. Well, I bet Fowler and Hoyle were the most stunned of all. <laughs> they were, indeed. Uh, right. Willie used to go around telling the story of this. Uh, he loved to tell the story in retrospect after they'd figured out how to deal with it. Yeah, and then just a few months later, Chandrasekhar at the University of Chicago published a paper that explained this relativistic instability that nobody had ever known about before. So this became part of the Feynman legend. Somehow Feynman just knew this instinctively, but Chandrasekhar had to work hard to discover it. Yeah, and so when I came back here on the faculty a few years later, I asked Dick about it. I said, Dick, how did you know? And Dick said, I'll show you. And so he went home and he brought back the next day 40 pages of handwritten calculations in which he had been working out the details of the collapse of a star months before uh, the Hoyle-Fowler theory. He'd been doing this because Johnny Wheeler, who was his mentor in mind, Johnny Wheeler at Princeton, had been challenging uh, everybody to understand the collapse of things to form what later became to be called black holes. And so driven by his intellectual curiosity, Dick had worked all of this out for himself. He must have had to solve those equations numerically. I suppose he used a slide rule. Indeed, he did. I saw the slide rule calculations step after step after step. But once he'd done the calculations, he uh, uh, went uh, and put the calculations away in his desk drawer and didn't think much more about it. He figured, well, other people know about this, and OK, now I understand that I'm happy. And then uh, in the middle of the Hoyle Fowler seminar, he suddenly realized, because of the calculations, uh, these things are going to be unstable. And so what to everybody in the audience seemed like a remarkable insight was actually the result of very hard work done, driven by his own intellectual curiosity. Well, that explains a lot. He must have had a lot of secrets in that drawer of his. Huh? I think he did. I think he did. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the first time I encountered Richard Feynman? No. Well, try to guess how old I was. I don't know, 21? <laughs> Way off. I was nine. Really? And when I was nine, I read this remarkable book, a wonderful book called The World of Science by Jane Werder Watson. And what especially captured my attention in this book was the chapter on theoretical physics. And it begins with the story of a small boy who has a red wagon with a ball in the back, and he notices that when he pulls the wagon forward, the ball rolls to the back, and when he stops pulling, the ball rolls to the front. So he asks his father, why does that happen? And his father said, well, that's called inertia, but nobody knows why. And so I thought, what's going on? When I saw an interview years later, this interview with Christopher Sykes, this great interview called The Pleasure of Finding Things Out, and Feynman tells the same story, I thought, this guy he stole that story from the book I read when I was a kid. <laughs> but then I looked at the book, hadn't looked at it in years, and I realized what had happened. Jane Warner Watson had based every chapter of the book on interviews with Caltech faculty. So that cleared up one mystery, though others remain. Yeah, like uh, why is Dick uh, wearing a bow tie and uh, where are Murray Gellman's glasses? Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I can't explain it. I don't really care. But uh, you're right. He always puts me down. <laughs> it's, it's an enduring mystery. And what was really terrific about this book is it described a discovery that had just been made in 1957, a year before 
the book was published, which was that the laws of nature actually know the difference between left and right. And that's what Feynman and Gell-Mann were working on at the time. And I thought that was so exciting, it got me interested in physics, which eventually led me to Caltech, where I joined Feynman on the faculty 21 years later. Wow. And you're going in another direction. Uh, you know, it was in the early 1960s that uh, uh, Richard Feynman revitalized, revamped uh, our uh, introductory course on physics, freshman and sophomore physics. And he uh, wrote up his lectures uh, in three volumes uh, that came to be called the Feynman Lectures on Physics, three volumes that had tremendous, tremendous insights because of his tremendous physical intuition, his great pedagogical power. Those uh, lectures uh, have sold a million and a half copies in the English language alone, uh, and they are uh, the most influential set of books on physics, I think, that the world has ever seen, the most widely influential. That's right, and for a lot of the students who attended those lectures, looking back, they consider Feynman's lectures to be their most memorable experience of their college years. Feynman loved an audience, yeah, yeah. he loved to perform, so every class was like a meticulously prepared performance. He had notes, like you can see on the table, but he didn't look at them. Every lecture was almost perfectly timed. Even the use of the chalkboards was very precisely choreographed. It was really remarkable. And even today, uh, the, uh, so many decades later, these lectures are of enormous value and interest to physicists, mature physicists and novices alike. They're being read by people all around the world. And uh, thanks to the heroic efforts of Michael Gottlieb, uh, Rudy Pfeiffer and others, they're available today uh, online in HTML format at the Feynman Lectures website. It's so great that they're available for free to anybody in the world because the lectures are amazing. I still dip into them every once in a while, you know, just for fun, yeah. and, and it's always a great experience to reread yeah. them. I bet you do too. I do, I do. I've got them sitting in my office at home. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, that time he taught the Feynman lectures for two years, that was the only time in his career at Caltech that Feynman officially taught an undergraduate course, but he was involved in undergraduate education, and one way was an unofficial course that was called Physics X, and it was really just Feynman standing in front of a classroom saying, ask me anything. He wanted the students to ask him questions about trying to understand something, and then he and the students would try to work it out together with Feynman standing at the blackboard. Do you remember Physics X? Oh, I remember it well. I was a freshman here in 1958-59, and uh, this course, Physics X, was something you heard about by word of mouth. It was not in the uh, Caltech catalog of courses. Uh, you didn't get credit for it. It wasn't advertised anywhere that you could read about. Uh, and I remember vividly one of the sessions of Physics X. We all went, we all, I and a number of my freshman friends, went to the rumored classroom at the rumored time and hoped that Feynman would show up. Feynman did show up. He looked around the class uh, of uh, freshmen and said, what do you want to talk about today? And somebody said, I want to know about water waves on Mars. It's pretty cold on Mars, it's isn't it? It's pretty cold on Mars, and that's what Feynman said. The water will be frozen. Uh, there will be no waves. Next question. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so one of the really smart kids said, OK, let's pretend, do a Gadonkin experiment. Pretend that we warm uh, the surface of Mars up. Why OK, now you've, got, now you've got real water, and you've got real water waves. And uh, so how fast are these waves going to propagate? And uh, so Feynman then uh, argued things through together with us. Uh, the uh, water's crest gets pulled down into a trough by gravity, but the pull of gravity on Mars is three times weaker than the pull on Earth. So surely the waves are going to prop more, propagate more slowly. And so let's go through and calculate it out and figure it out together. And hand in hand together, we worked at it, the whole, the whole class with Feynman, and figured out that it propagates square root of three times more slowly on Mars than on Earth. And then the question was, and how big are the waves going to be? And so we speculated together with him, what causes the waves? How, do, how did they get generated? And finally, he explained, it's the turbulent pounding of air on the uh, surface of the water that generates the waves. But the density of the air is going to be lower on Mars, a lot lower than it is on the surface of, uh, than on the Earth. 
and so the pounding will be a lot weaker, the waves will be a lot smaller, and we went through and uh, worked out some of the details. And I emerged from that class that day just so, men so tremendously inspired that I remember it to this day more than half a century later. So not, not a whole lot of fun surfing on Mars then. <laughs> not a whole lot of fun. Unless surfing. you're one of those yeah. little itty bitty Martians. Yeah. <laughs> right, well I guess he was trying to drive home a couple of lessons. One is that physics should be fun. Yes. And the other is that everything in science can be interesting if you delve into it deeply. Yes, yes. Well he was just a, such a great explainer and he loved to explain things and, and that was definitely still true when I knew him in the 1980s. And I remember that in 1987, uh, the Rogers Commission was finished investigating the Challenger disaster, and Feynman was very eager to dive back into physics, and he was particularly excited about a new idea he had, a way to describe mathematically what happens when two protons collide at very high energy. But to follow through on that idea, he had to learn a subject that was new for him, something called integrable models, and he thought, well, it would be fun to learn this by meeting with students to discuss it. And so he had a weekly meeting in his office with a small group of students, and they would talk about integrable models. And as the year went on, uh, Feynman was getting increasingly ill, but he really looked forward to those Wednesday meetings, and he never missed them. And it was very inspiring to the students to see how excited he was about the topic, how engaged in how much fun he had discussing it. And his exhortations to the students were still on his blackboard at the time he died. He told them that they should know the tools of mathematical physics, they should know how to solve every problem that has been solved exactly, but he also emphasized that they should work out the solution to these solved problems themselves. They shouldn't just follow in the steps that others had followed because he said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. But he made one exception to that, which was he arranged for his notes to be shared with the students after he died. And when the students saw them, they were flabbergasted because these notes were so voluminous and so meticulously detailed. And Feynman had delved into the subject much deeper than they suspected from those discussions. Yes, we lost Feynman on February 15th, 1988. It was a tremendously sad day for us all at Caltech. Uh, Richard Feynman was a loved, honored, cherished friend of all of us. Uh, he uh, was a hero to the faculty, the students, uh, and the staff alike. Uh, and he was built, embedded deep in the culture of this place. That's for sure. I remember that day, and it was indeed a sad day, but you know, it it's been 30 years, and since then, many students have come and gone who didn't know Feynman personally, but like us, they've been deeply influenced by him in many ways, by his scientific accomplishments, by his ideas, by his writing, and by his playfulness. So really, the spirit of Dick Feynman lives on among curious scientists all over the world. Indeed, it does. You know, Kip, he won't be forgotten. <laughs>